Hi, I'm Chris Roselli. And I'm Tina Thatch, and welcome to Western Window, a show made for you by students at Western Washington University. In today's show, we'll show you a Western alum who is trying to make a difference in our community as she creates a positive culture for both men and women. We talk with Western Assistant Professor Michael Frass about concussions in our young athletes. We showcase some talented students from neuroscience as they dive into research and community outreach. And we'll open the window to makeshift art space. So stay with us as we explore the world through Western Window. Rebecca Rivero is a Western alumna who is making a difference. She has created middlewomen.com as a dynamic resource for individuals who battle physical, mental, emotional, or social issues and disorders while simultaneously battling body dissatisfaction. Rebecca's work gives hope and encourages men and women to celebrate their individuality and learn new skills to live a more positive life. Chris Headland has the story. There's so many people out there with such important roles to play in society, but there's a lack of connection, and we're trying to provide a, a base platform with support so that they can come into an existing system and make it better. Middle Women started as a Tumblr blog two and a half years ago based on the idea that if we could create alternative um, media, particularly photography that wasn't photoshopped, then we could start giving people something else to look at and hopefully get to the point where people were accepting of who they were as individuals. The inspiration was definitely my own disordered eating and then the relationships I was forming with other people online who were also struggling and just learning that everybody's experiences were very, very different, even though medical language was trying to group us into very specific categories, we were realizing that the resources weren't really out there for people who didn't fit in those boxes. So the original idea was just to be able to uh, basically just start the conversation that maybe there was more that was needed. There was never really the plan that we were going to be what was needed, it was just that we wanted to put it out there, that these conversations about how people are struggling and what recovery could really look like wasn't really happening yet, and I really personally wanted it to start so that people like me who didn't fit in the boxes could receive help at a much younger age than I did. So solution-based problem solving, at least in our opinion, is noticing the problem, acknowledging it, and then trying to put most of our energy into figuring out what the solutions are to that problem because there's so many solutions to any given problem. And then also taking it another step further, which is what will the world be like once those solutions are successfully implemented? I would say that when you're focusing on the problem, people put up barriers like you're doing something wrong like oh like I'm <laughs> not or you know I'm defensive about that right and it it makes change slow a less direct way of targeting issues is to understand them understand what the problems are and instead of pointing at the problems pointing at the solutions when you when you take a step back and look at the process that's going on we're kind of guiding everyone in, and, and showing people through examples of what we do appreciate and what we do like.
I think people join a club at a college because they're trying to connect with peers mm -hmm. and it's hard and we're trying to create a safe space where they can do that effectively with with people that share like-minded goals mm -hmm. and so ultimately our goal as Westerns chapter of middle women being kind of the flagship of trying to see what a middle women club can be like and so we are working with them to learn all these things and try and fail and see what's working yeah. with the ultimate goal by the end of this academic year to have a package together that we can send off to any school who's interested in starting a chapter. Yeah. We're trying to create something that anybody can see one day and it'll make it easier for them to get started because we don't want anybody to have the barriers that we've had right. starting from scratch. At least <laughs> giving them the opportunity to start something knowing that they have a lot of support. Concussions in athletics has been at the forefront of the news recently, not just at the professional level, but especially within youth sports. I'm here with Assistant Professor Michael Frass, who works in the Communication Sciences and Disorders Department here at Western, who has been working on this very issue in young athletes sustaining concussions, and he's here with us in uh, the studio today. So thanks so much for being here with Thank us, you, Michael. Chris. Yeah, good to be here. Really appreciate it. So concussions, it has been really at the forefront of the news, but I think one thing that a lot of people don't necessarily understand, and I don't understand fully, is really what a concussion is. Yeah, well, a concussion is a brain injury, and I think that is something that really needs to get, that point needs to get across to people. It's a brain injury, and uh, it's usually due to direct or indirect blow to the head, but it can also be a contact to the body with enough force can cause uh, head trauma. There are about 1.6 to 3.8 million uh, that occur each year in the United States. That's an estimate. And the CDC um, indicates that we don't know the exact number because people fail to report their concussions. What are the signs? How does somebody know if they've been concussed? Well, cognitive signs might include um, loss of memory or attention problems, sense of confusion, feeling slowed down. Physical symptoms would be a headache or dizziness, slowed speech. There are sensory symptoms as like sensitivity to light or to sound. And then there are some emotional changes like irritability or moodiness, depression, anxiety. Is there a sustained injury that can happen mm. or is it something that heals over time? Yeah. Well, concussion is really a functional problem, not a structural problem, meaning that uh, a structural problem would be actual damage to the outer part of the brain, like swelling or bleeding in the brain. And that can happen, but it's a smaller case. Is what is usually happening at a functional level inside the cell is there's a change in the state of the cell. So ions flowing in and out of the cell cause the cell to be overexcited. And that cell needs energy which comes from the blood in order to maintain homeostasis in the cell. However, after a concussion, there's actually a drop in cerebral blood flow that can last for seven to 10 days. So in that period of time, the brain is very vulnerable to um, a second impact. Most people will recover within that seven to 10 days, sometimes you know, much quicker than that. Others may persist for weeks, months, even years. If that symptom um, persistence goes on for over a month, we would say they have a uh, post-concussion syndrome. Uh, and that really has a big impact on getting back into the classroom and, and functioning effectively on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. Do you think enough's being done to protect our student athletes? Well, back in 2009, Washington was the first state in the country to pass legislation to protect um, youth athletes from concussion. This was known as the Zachary Lystead Law. And it had three tenets. Um, the first being that if a child is suspected of having a concussion, they'd be removed from the game immediately and not return to the game. Then they need to be cleared by a trained medical professional who signs off on their 
um, recovery before they're able to return to play. And the most important aspect of that, I think, is also the education to um, parents and coaches and players on what is a concussion and what are the symptoms and, and how it's best managed. While that has been in effect in, in Washington since then, and all 50 states now have legislation that is very similar, I don't think it's being carried out in the way that it should. Um, and there hasn't been a lot of talk about how to effectively return an athlete to the classroom. We have clear return to play guidelines that um, have a step-by-step -step process for getting the, the, the athlete back uh, onto the playing field, but very little about how to get them back into the classroom successfully. And we're finding that once they're asymptomatic, they go back to full-time education right away and they're unable to handle it and they break down. But because there's no outward symptoms, they look fine, there's no visual injury going on, people have a hard time understanding why they are struggling where before they, they had no problem. And the athlete themselves is confused by that and that, that helps to perseverate emotional problems like depression and anxiety. I wanted to go back to the return to learn concept because obviously at the pro athlete level, <clears throat> they're not going back to the classroom necessarily, they're going back to families and things like that. Mm -hmm. But with youth sports playing such a major role, especially in the high school and collegiate level, uh, what do you suggest? What do you think could be some possible solutions to help students get back into the classroom after a concussion? Well, if you think about all the demands that kids, like high school kids, have to deal with on a daily basis. You know, there's a lot of physical demand. There are, of course, the academic demands of sitting in a classroom and note-taking and studying for exams and completing exams and assignments on a timely basis. And if you throw a child right back into that situation for a full day, uh, it's a good possibility that they're going to fail. And so some people have been looking at this issue and see the, the need to have a graded return to learn policy in place. So you start off slowly easing the child back into the classroom. Maybe they start with one class a day. If, if they're asymptomatic after that, then maybe they can progress to two classes. Um, other things like, other sensory issues like screen time, so on a computer or using their, their smartphone, that can also exacerbate a concussion. So easing back into to use of those um, types of devices. So do you have an opportunity to work with Western's athletes on campus, whether it be at the intercollegiate level or in the club sports or intramurals? Yeah, I've been working with one athlete, uh, one student from Western in particular, who came to me with symptoms of post-concussion syndrome. These, these concussion symptoms had been lasting for over a month, and he had had about five concussions in a period of six months. Wow. And so he came to our clinic, the speech, language, and hearing clinic here um, on Western's campus. Under the uh, direction of myself and my colleague, Leslie Stevens, and working with graduate uh, student clinicians, we set up a program for him where we addressed some attention problems and we helped him organize and um, try to prepare himself for the, to, to be more effective in the classroom. And he started to benefit from that. We did some neuropsych testing on him and found that indeed after working with us for a couple of quarters, he is making some progress um, and it's been great to see that, but of course he's, he's very frustrated with the situation. Are you working with other students from the research level? I mean, I know one of the real strengths to yeah. Western is, is that our undergraduates get some really cool opportunities to work with faculty like yourself. Yeah, sure. In, in my lab, we're starting to look at uh, changes in speech function. So we collect baseline data at the start of the season, giving the athletes a, a few little sp uh, speech tasks to perform. Hmm. And um, if they are concussed, they report back to us, hopefully within 24 to 48 hours, and Try we record their speech again and then look to see what's going on. Um, 
Juliana DeBurgo, who was a graduate student of mine um, last year, she found that there are indeed some measurable changes in speech function in the concussed athlete. And so we, of course, need to collect a lot more data to know exactly what's going on, but could have some implications for diagnosing and making um, return to play and return to learn um, possible. And what can families do to help educate their kids or at least help prevent their kids from getting concussions? I don't think people need to start panicking and pulling their kids out of sport. What they need to do is start asking questions like how are injuries being managed? Who's managing these injuries? Um, what mechanisms are in place for safely returning my child to sport or, or more importantly to the classroom? So education is certainly a key. We also need to change the culture within sport. So, you know, I know when I was growing up, the culture was, okay, shake it off, get back in there. Mm -hmm. And w this, is, this is the problem for, for long-term types of injuries. Um, coaches need to be more aware of these injuries and they need to be more responsible in how their athletes are, are managed. Well, Michael, thank you so very much for being here. Yeah, really do appreciate here, it. And we're really lucky to have people like you working at Western and working with our students. It's really, we're really fortunate to have that. Thank so, you very much. Good thank to you. be here. Dr. Michael Frass and Western's Communication Sciences and Disorders. The neuroscience program at Western is teaming with nerds an affectionate name given by those students standing for neuroscience research-driven students. They're stoked about brains, and not only are they using theirs for research, but also helping kids learn in the community. It's an interdisciplinary program that's about seven years old now. Uh, it was originally um, put together by two faculty from biology uh, and two faculty from psychology that had an interest in brain and behavior. One of the things about neurosciences is that it combines significant aspects of biology, chemistry, psychology, uh, depending on what part of neurosciences you're interested in, computer science, philosophy, uh, and so almost by definition a neuroscientist has a, has a big picture. The best students are those who come to the field because they are extremely passionate about understanding how the central nervous system functions. Nerds started before I was an undergraduate at Western. I was still a little stem cell when the nerds were getting started. Um, it stands for Neuroscience Research Driven Students and the whole point of it is to really immerse ourselves in the current research. Um, beyond the lab and beyond the classroom and to get involved in it in a, an interesting, exciting way. I mean, science has kind of a bad rap for being boring and we're really, we're against that. We like to make it interesting. As a, a faculty advisor to, to the nerds, one of the things I'm proudest about with them is the amount of involvement they have in our community. Uh, they uh, seek out opportunities to share their passion for neurosciences with anybody who will listen. I definitely, I really like the outreach program that we are involved with. We are going out and teaching people about neuroscience and about our program. The last one I was at was uh, fourth and fifth graders. Explain, well the brain is really awesome. The brain does this and it does this and here's what's going on when you are talking and thinking and writing and even though they're really young, they're able to comprehend this and they think it's really interesting. I think that's the most fun part. Uh, at Neuroscience on Tap, they're talking to you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 year olds. Uh, when we're at the Y, they're talking to four year olds and in all of those different stages, they know how to, how to pitch a story and, and how to you know, uh, describe what we do in a way that it makes it accessible to whoever they're talking to. So SFN is the Society for Neuroscience, and so pretty much you just 
put 40,000 neuroscientists in a convention center for five days and it's just, it's pretty amazing. It's a huge academic meeting and it's something that we take a uh, contingent of undergrads to every year um, to present their data. So that's a couple years worth of research for me. Um, and that meant that I had to get all this data that I'd collected from, you know, 30 or so mice with the most recent study and cram it all into one poster that made sense and was coherent and was something that I would be proud to present to PhDs. And I did present it to PhDs. It's this huge poster session. There are thousands of posters and people look you up based on what they're interested in and they'll come by and ask you questions. They'll interrogate you about your research. And it's a really interesting experience because when you present to the Society for Neurosciences, there could be 4,000 posters on the floor at one time. And people will come up, other PhDs, um, postdocs, graduate students. Uh, our students are unique in the sense that most of them are, are undergrads and it very often blows people away because they'll be talking to this person and, and getting a walk through and you'll see them looking at their name tag and, and they slowly realize, oh my god, this person's an undergrad. And it's a chance for the undergrads to really get a sense of where they are and what their work has allowed them to do. Because the NERDS group um, has been so successful, uh, it really has uh, defined a sense of community for students that ends up being carried beyond the, the walls of Western. And so we maintain, the faculty maintain contact with a lot of the students. The students maintain contact with one another. And I think just going forward, uh, this is going to be an enormous advantage to our students because so much of what happens in your career later on is about networking. And they've built this network at the undergraduate level that they're going to carry forward with them. Certainly for me, but I think for all the faculty, the program's been more than we ever could have hoped for. Uh, It's a, it's a great group of faculty, the staff people are fantastic, uh, and we consistently get these interesting, personable, hardworking, committed, driven, uh, passionate students that uh, just makes the whole thing, I mean, it's not work most of the time, it's, uh, you know, it's been a success. Another great thing about neuroscience is you get in there and you can find a new area where You know, maybe no one has trodden before. You can really pioneer your own area. You know, there's a lot of brain to go around. Western students interested in art and music have a great local resource to tap into. To include an art gallery, art and music studios, and a music venue. All in a safe and healthy environment and music hub called Makeshift. You're in a band, it's a, it, come to the makeshift. It's such an amazing resource for a lot of people. I think we make a positive difference in a lot of ways. I mean, our mission is to help artists and musicians succeed. And I think we do that. I'm Kat C. I'm the executive director at Makeshift, so I've been here for about six years. And the executive director is sort of the, the big umbrella of the whole organization. Uh, I answer to our board of directors like any like you would at any nonprofit. Um, but basically, I'm the manager of all the smaller pieces of Makeshift. We had a casserole feed in a side yard of a crappy punk house, and that's that was when Makeshift formed. So basically, you know, um, we were all all the people who were founders were either musicians themselves or music fans involved in the scene somehow and it started with a focus specifically on music and art kind of came later you know makeshift sort of started with that idea of how can we help musicians have an easier time in the DIY scene touring things like that and all of this came from that so it it definitely has changed over the years you know we started with a focus on both helping musicians and helping the environment. That was actually our initial um, mission. And so that started with a biodiesel van, 
with bike powered generators that powered shows and we did all sorts of stuff before we finally realized that actually just helping on the most basic levels like providing a venue, providing a space for all ages people to come see, see music, providing gallery space, providing studios, that that was actually kind of the core of supporting music and art. So, so here we are. We offer internships um, where you can get school credit for like a variety of different things. Other opportunities that you have are to get like, like basically professional experience as a booker, professional experience as a sound person, professional experience doing uh, like managing the art space, the art gallery. Um, there's so many different opportunities that are available to you. It's a good place for exhibiting artists up and coming like myself, trying to get their stuff out there. Um, you can contact them and they can usually get you set up with a show if you lay down the money for it. But uh, yeah, no, so it's a, it's a good place. So the show that's up right now is called Transitions and it was a collaboration between uh, Western and Makeshift. And we've actually done Western Makeshift shows several times in the past. So um, we work with the art department. This time it was Seiko, um, an instructor up there. And uh, we do also, in addition to this show, um, which basically, you know, we worked with Seiko to develop the theme transitions. She worked with her students to make sure that they fulfilled all the requirements for hanging and all that. Uh, we also do BFA shows, which is the Bachelor of Fine Arts final show. So um, BFA senior students have to show their work. And before this, you know, you had the VU and, you know, the other spaces around campus. But there were very few spaces off campus that students could show their work. And on campus is awesome, but having on your resume that you've shown off campus is really valuable. Uh, there's not really anything that holds a candle to makeshift. I mean, um, it's the all ages, it's Bellingham's all ages space. Um, and it's been that for seven years. Thank you for joining us. That wraps up this episode of Western Window. Be sure to tune in next time as we explore the world at and around Western Washington University.